Well, hello all. It's the second day of the shutdown here in Los Angeles and keeping everybody quarantined in their homes. So it's pretty weird. I mean, a city of this many millions of people where you normally, if you get on the road, it's bumper to bumper everywhere you go. And to see it being kind of a ghost town is kind of strange. But you can still get out to go get medicines and food and a few other things. And, and strangely enough, because the weather was beautiful today, a lot of people went to the beach and sort of kind of violated the quarantine. But I don't think they arrested anybody. So I'm pretty sure it went by smoothly enough. But I wanted to do uh, another little video here because I have obviously been stuck in my house and painting, writing, and doing some looking into different games to discuss with you. And the one I'm going to discuss to, with you today is Warhammer Quest. Now, this is Games Workshop, which I have a real love-hate relationship with. Um, I'm not going to go into the reasons, but let's just say there's many decades of hard feelings um, with them and games that I have really enjoyed. Now, Warhammer Quest um, came from HeroQuest, which was produced in 1989. Um, it was basically to help support their Warhammer Fantasy role-playing system, which came out in the mid-80s, which was kind of very interesting. I have a copy of it lying around here. It wasn't bad. I mean, it was kind of fun. Um, you started out as a certain class, and then as you progressed, you would pick up a secondary class, and you would add the other features and skills and the like in. And it was kind of interesting. Um, Matt Coville's favorite rat catcher uh, thing that he talks about when he's running his game, uh, that came from Warhammer uh, fantasy role-playing. But we played Hero Quest, my buddy Steve and I, uh, quite a bit in the early 90s. And then uh, Warhammer Quest came out. And Warhammer Quest, I think, was the next extension of what Games Workshop was trying to do to connect a miniature game and a role-playing game together. And they did really, really a good job on it. And it was really very fun. And what I liked about it, personally, is it didn't really require a game master. It had a very campaign feeling because your characters would advance. They had little towns and special locations you could go to. The dungeons were all random, so you could... Take your four characters, which could be up to four players. You went in, you rolled randomly to determine what adventure you were on. You then had the cards that were used to build the adventure. You started playing it, and you didn't necessarily know how it was going to go. And it was a lot of fun, because you could... Uh, really just have that feeling of let's get together in Dungeon Crawl, even a little role-playing feel involved, even advancing your characters and making them interesting and unusual and different from everybody else, and still not require a game master, was how to then add role-playing and turn this into a role-playing system. And in all fairness, it's kind of a fair role-playing system. It's not bad. Uh, it's fairly easy. Uh, they got a lot of support content. Uh, it was it was pretty good. And in the purchasing of the game, you got tons and tons of miniatures because they were putting miniatures out to support the hobby. And in the original rules, you get a bunch. Four heroes and umpteen amounts of monsters, lots of nice little cardboard colored dungeon tiles, which were very cool, and some neat little uh, plastic doorways and things that were, were very, very neat and looked really cool. So of course now I'm thinking about maybe running this a little bit for some people. I'm of course having to now update the doorways and dry brush them and wash them and paint them and like and, and make them a little uh, unusual. But all the board pieces are really functional. So this was the main box set of Warhammer Quest. And they came out with a lot of contents. Now, in the original box set, it had lots of stuff that came in it. And it was fun. Many of the D&D &D games that are like this now that I think they latched on and then produced their own. And they look beautiful. They come with miniatures. They come with boards. And they allow you to play these characters up to a certain level to maybe build them up uh, to fit into a D&D &D game, which I thought was very, very smart. It is what Games Workshop wanted to do, but since their role-playing system obviously never got the traction that Dungeons and Dragons ever did, it never really happened. But they did come up with a lot of very interesting things. They had expansions that gave you more dungeons, more monsters, more situations, more um, elements to add. And that made it really fun because the point was, is that we could have four experienced game masters get together at my shop, at our house, it didn't really matter, 
And we could run a series of dungeons where you would run on the dungeons and there was a town and you would come back and you would draw an event. Then you could go to different locations and the locations could give you a chance to buy stuff or sell stuff, acquire items, um, and then use your goal and experience to buy additional levels. And as you acquired additional levels, you would get more and more interesting and powerful skills. Now, um, they came up with heroes in addition that you could buy. Anything that they could get in that you could spend and give them more money to add to their coffers. Now, that's always been the game shop way. I don't necessarily have a problem with that. I think it helped a lot of game companies make money um, and value their game products up to the point where you can see some beautiful things now that get produced. They're not necessarily inexpensive, but in many cases, they're truly fabulous. And that's what I like. Now, there was one major problem with Warhammer Quest that a lot of people voiced. It was bloody. It was not uncommon to have party trashes on a regular basis. It was as if Jim Murphy ran multiple Murphy Orc Traps or Matt Coville, Coville Screw, and you would run into tons of... Because you had random encounters every time the wizard rolled a power die and rolled a one. And the wizards, that was determining how much mana he had. So the wizard would have between one and six mana available for him at each turn, plus a benefit modifier for his level. Thusly though, a one is still a one, thusly random encounters. It was not uncommon to run into a room with some monsters, get into battle, start having, you know, like you're winning the battle, having some good strategy, and then a one is rolled and more random monsters leap in. And you fight a couple more rounds, then another one is rolled, and then another one is rolled, and then another one is rolled, and suddenly you look down and you realize you had four times the monsters that you started the battle with now trying to eat you. It was kind of a problem. There's no reason you can't take the things that are here, modify them slightly, and put them in any game system you want to use. And that is a real great thing. Don and I, when we used to play the Fantasy Trip regularly, made up a random game generator where we could just randomly generate a dungeon, very much like what was done here, except we did it in the 70s. Um, and then we had an envelope for all special rooms. So you had the you know chance, it was a room, and it had this encounter, and you'd roll on charts and stuff. And it was all fun and easy. But then there was the envelope of special rooms where we would make up these little special, you know, encounters where it would show the map and it would show what the creatures were and what reaction was. And that was really cool. And, and sometimes it was a little surprising, like the time we were running an entire party of elves who only had light weapons, piercing weapons. And we opened it up, pulled out one of Don's specials. And, Don, and we, as I started to read it, Don said, oops, we're all dead because it was skeletons and skeletons couldn't be attacked and injured by piercing weapons. And the secret door closed and locked. You had to beat the monsters before the secret door would open. And we didn't have anything but bows and rapiers. And you can understand where that went. We generated new characters and started again. I was going to do a whole mambo where I was going to set the miniatures that I've got there. Because, of course, they're beautifully painted. And the tiles and run it all down the line. But I went on to YouTube. And there are a lot of really nice, comprehensive Warhammer Quest how to play the original game, Mambos, where literally they're showing you room for room, how the battles go, and they're actually pretty nicely done. They're a couple of years old, but you have to understand that this is a game that's 20 some odd years old, and it's not likely to be readily available in the store. So most of this faded away, but they're still there online. These guys did a nice job, um, more than likely as good as I would have done. I still might do it down the road to show you some interesting things, but there's so much more I want to talk to about different game systems. I don't know whether I'll get back to Warhammer Quest, but I wanted you to see this, and I wanted you to understand what's out there. Now, I went on eBay and I started looking at this, and it looks like the basic starter set you can pick up for maybe a hundred and some dollars if you are so inclined. Um, the modules tend to be substantially more expensive and harder to find. I mean, I think they were originally like in the $25 range when they were new. I think you can't pick them up for anything less than $50 or $60. So if you want all of this in the original component item, you're likely going to pay quite a bit. The individual characters were like $20 a piece, and some of them I've seen, if you can find them online, are in the excess of $30 or more dollars a piece. So again, these components are very difficult to find if you want the original stuff. But understand, of course, 
Now in the modern age, most people have scanned them and put them up. You can find a lot of these characters already online. I've got photocopies of at least six or seven of them that I don't have the miniatures for, but it doesn't matter. The Druid, well, I have half a dozen painted Druid miniatures, not hard for me to put it out. Yes, I don't have the little disc components and some of the little special things they would give you, but I can easily make my own. So this is a thought if you're working on a shoestring, um, and you want to play it, but you don't have the money, I think you can more than likely find it on the internet and get whatever you want. I would say dole out for the original game if you can find it on eBay or anyplace else. Because now they're 25 years old, I think the interest level keeps waning and waning each year. Because I remember maybe 10 years ago that Warmer Quest was more than likely well over 200 and some dollars a, a, for a unit. And that seems to have dropped off. So it's gettable. And in, you know, without the economy destroying the situation that's going on now, a lot of you who have good jobs and money want, want to buy it and share it with your friends. So now I'm going to stop for a minute. And I'm going to turn it around. I'm going to go through the thing that really makes this a role-playing game. And in my mind, what really made it quite unique and still makes it unique to this day. Uh, Matt had showed an interest in wanting to maybe do a video on this sometime and, and you know have all his guys playing it. So maybe we'll get to that when, if Matt ever has any copious free time. But until then, I wanted you to take a look what was here and see if it might be something that would be enjoyable for you to play. Go on and check out these other videos of people showing you how to play if you do, because they show you a lot of the mechanics that they use, because there are some tricks of playing the game that, you know, it's like anything with a game. There's a little special way, you know, it's, it's like playing the system, not necessarily playing the RPG, but it is very usable as an RPG. Um, we discovered that even in original Hero Quest when Steve and I modified it up to be a role playing system. And we had some fun with it. Now, there were so many other systems out there at the time, so we kept spending time in, in with that. But still, my point is the same. There's lots out there that maybe you've never seen that I think if you got it, you'd love it, you'd enjoy it. You might even enjoy getting into it. Warhammer uh, Fantasy Roleplaying has been sold by GW, I think, multiple times. I think it's, it's in its fourth edition. Uh, by four different companies where they're just sort of reprinting and cleaning up and putting the rules back out. I've never looked at one other than the original, so I can't tell you if there's any changes or a difference or improvements, but those are also available on eBay at a pretty reasonable price. So if it's something that kind of gets your your interests going to maybe have something different and interesting to play... Um, this might be it. Plus, the Games Workshop has a very comprehensive world. Um, they put out lots of junk. They're constantly changing it and giving you new stuff and updated stuff. So they're not likely to ever go away. And I'm kind of surprised they haven't kind of revisited this and updated it to the modern Age of Sigmar type of thing and tried to reissue it. And they might. And if they're out there, maybe they should. I think maybe the only problem is, because Games Workshop figures I, I find very expensive, I cannot imagine now what it would cost to reproduce the original. But you never know. They might do it. And in which case, I might recommend it. So I'm going to go ahead and stop now, flip the thing around, and let you take a look at the book. Anyway, uh, enjoy your captivity. We're going to be playing um, our D&D &D game tomorrow on, on Google Hangouts. So... You know, we're just trying to game on and, and keep going. But fight me, devils, fight, for you know I hate peace. Keep healthy out there, and we'll see you soon. Game on. And here's what really makes the game a little different than those other miniature army battle sort of games. They have a situation that, like I said, it lets you run a role-playing campaign. And if you look at it, you see what you have is the Warhammer world, which is their overland have linking battles on how to basically have your characters go from one adventure to another, what you do between adventures, traveling, going to villages, going to the settlements, checking your hazards, and then all these different locations that your characters can go to to buy and sell equipment. There's basic stuff you can get. Then they start having additional rules. They start having psychology rules. And then how you develop your your warriors and stuff. So as they get higher level, they gain additional skills and hit points and everything like that and become substantially more difficult. How to mix a party, training, so how you get up from one level to another and how much it costs to do so. And then basically the different skills and the wizard trainings. And then they do advanced treasures, advanced dungeon hordes, 
And then they do an advanced bestiary, which is really cool. And then they talk about game mastering, how to essentially run role playing. Now, this is nothing new, pretty much how to do it, but it's basically how to take these rules and turn it into a role playing game where you can have a DM and four players. Still, the fun thing about it is when we were doing this, I was actually making my own rules to keep allowing us to make solitary, high level adventure dungeons that made it fun for Steve and I to just keep moving our characters up. The great thing to remember, as I said in this though, the outcome in this is very tough to keep your characters alive. Death, death is normally the standard way these characters come to an end. You don't retire many, you end up normally burying them. But it's a lot of fun, and you know what? If you play it some and you start finding out that I'm wrong, let me know. It's been a long time since I played. I'm kind of looking forward to playing it again. A nice thing about it is it's got really great solitary factor. So since I'm shut in, I can generate four characters and then run them against the solo dungeons and advance them and do everything else. And I really don't need anybody else to play. Though, of course, it's so much more fun when you have other friends to play with you. So anyway, enjoy the game. I hope this was helpful and enlightening. Check out those other players' videos on there on how to actually run the game so they can give you mechanics and then look for bargains on being able to buy the game. So it's a fun game and I think you'll enjoy it. And I think if nothing else, you'll have things that you can take from this and add to your own campaign adventures. Have a good one. Game on.